Thanks very much, and thanks for the introduction, Andrew. And it's always a pleasure, and particularly a pleasure to be here in, perfect, uh, in person. Um, so I thought, rather than try and juxtapose public health versus an individualized approach, which is actually quite simple, uh, I thought to rather reflect more on the public health approach in general and some of the things we're going to need to think about, particularly around first line and what's happened in the last three or four years, building on the talk I gave in the clinician section I gave in, um, on Monday, um, and some of the things that have cropped up and just some of the hard things we're going to need to think about um, with the new drugs that have come to us um, and some of the, what I would consider some of the distractions actually of some of the debates that have come through and then how to consider some of the data that people like Nick have thrown at us which have made some of the decisions in, quite complex in terms of how we use these things. So let me take you through these things. These are my various disclosures. Um, so firstly, the public health approach, I was Googling this a couple of days ago, and in fact, it's a whole litany of sins. It's pretty much whatever you want it to be. So after getting past my annoyance when I realized actually I never really scrutinized this definition, it's generally for us, I think, quite intuitive. It's kind of, um, you know, in a low resource setting, it's kind of what do you do when you haven't got everything in front of you, um, when you've got limited supply lines, when you don't have, you know, a a brilliant lab with every single test underneath the sun and when you don't have every specialist um, to look after you and that kind of I think for all of us working in low resource settings you know we do with what we can but when you think about it, even in the richest countries they don't have every single thing in front of them not everybody has a specialist infectious diseases ARV specialist around the corner in the office next door so everybody does have a certain limitation so everyone does to a certain point deal with resource limitations so this idea is actually not that useful. And I do remember, though, in the early days of the public health approach, the sort of 2003 era when people were talking about, there was a certain swagger to people in the more resource-rich area. And this was not just in northern hemisphere countries, but even in my own country, people who were in the private sector would say, you know, you poor little people working in the public sector, we'll do the individualized approach because we'll have lots and lots of regimens and things. And I think there's been a certain, that swagger's gone for a certain reason. I'll show you now. Is that because the public health approach in many ways has actually performed so extraordinarily well that's allowed people, those of us involved in the public health approach, to actually ask some really harsh questions, which is like, why are you wasting so much money on stuff that has absolutely no evidence base behind it? Nick's pointed to it there around genotyping, for instance. Why are you doing genotyping? The only studies we have that show genotyping is cost effective or actually has any evidence based comes from the early 2000s. We have no data to suggest that genotyping works. In fact, we've got tons of data now that shows that it's a complete waste of money. But the rich countries continue to do it anyway because reasons, you know, clinicians love their tests. But that money gets done. We do lots and lots of blood tests, in fact, in HIV medicine that have very little to justify them. Um, everything from creatinine testing to full blood counts to a whole range of tests that, um, and depending on how much money you have, you just continue to waste that money on these various things. We have lots and lots of drug regimens. We have a whole range of um, specialist drug healthcare workers. We bring people back again and again and again with very little justification for, for doing those things. So many people from the public health approach are feeling quite smug now, turning around. And we have this from other diseases. We have it from TB, we have it from STDs, where prescription, uh, prescriptive approaches in terms of which drugs you prescribe, which tests you use, are often um, demonstrating much better outcomes. So this low middle income country shawl of shame, we used to call it around the, low, uh, around the public health approach, is actually starting to become kind of like, why do you guys waste your money? Like, you know, why don't you spend your money on other things? Now I'm gonna come back to this because I think the public health approach does need some challenging around what else we start adding to the public health approach. So where are we in 2022 with this approach? And there's some really amazing things around this. We've got TLD, whether you use Tenofovir, in a couple of countries now, Tenofovir has been replaced with TAF um, in pretty much everywhere. And in rich countries, we've got its alternate, which is TAF, um, Big Tegavir, or Tenofovir, Big Tegavir, pretty much is used everywhere. You know, it's replaced the Favarin's-based regimens or the NNRTI-based regimens pretty much across the globe. We are dependent on second-generation integrase inhibitors. Um, pretty much first line and second line, third line, these drugs have replaced, um, have replaced air, all the legacy regimens. If Favarin's is rapidly becoming extinct, all the NNRTIs are actually rapidly becoming extinct. The protease inhibitors are used in vanishingly small numbers of people. Um, 
there's no real, there, it's, we're, we're moving steadily towards um, relatively few numbers of people with, you know, on second line therapy. In my country, we've gone from about 150, 200,000 people on second line to probably about 30 or 40,000 people. So this rapidly diminishing number because of the amazing work that people like Nick and Graham Manchies and other people have done on second line therapy, we're now confident of moving people back onto what was traditionally first line therapy. In fact, concepts like first and second line therapy don't really, are not really meaningful any longer. Um, the toxicity profile of these drugs is actually astounding when you look at compared to the old days of D4TE or even of efavirenz. Um, you know, the patient's tolerance of the second generation integrase inhibitors is, is, is remarkable. And the resistance profile is even more astounding. When you look at it, um, you know, the, to find patients who failed first line, second generation integrase inhibitors who have not been exposed to integrase inhibitors before is next to impossible. There's a handful of patients in the literature and they always have some complicated story. So these drugs really are performing at a level that we have not, we are just not used to. And, they, and Leon Levine in the is in the audience, he keeps saying it's coming, it's coming. But we're sitting here a couple of years in, in some cases like Canada, they've been using integrase inhibitors for the best part of uh, like a decade. You know, we, we've been using these drugs now in, in low middle income countries for in tens of millions of people. We broke Kalitra very, very quickly. You know, we haven't broken this class of drugs yet. Maybe it's coming, but we, we're going to, they are performing very, very well. Um, and the steady movement of, of these drugs, like Ernest, uh, in drugs like um, studies like Nadia and Artist and Ernest, allowing us to be, be confident of moving patients on second and third line back onto these first line regimens is, and back onto TLD is really, really remarkable. And now we've been to this debate around second and third line drugs and hepatitis B and everything else, which is really important. So the couple of lessons I thought I'd like to reflect on, but it's always important to think new kids on the block are going to come. And I think we, it's really useful to think back to 2008 um, when the great harmonization happened around, when we moved away from the viripine and we moved away from D4T and we, everybody sort of ended up on tenofovir, um, either 3TC or FTC in South Africa, um, or efavirenz, and we could move patients across borders, but everyone had the same thing because we were happy about it on pregnancy, we were happy about it on TB, um, every, all the generics were making the same thing, um, and we knew that the transition to second line, to the protease inhibitors, we had f a r good observational evidence. Nick later on demonstrated that we could, we, and the RCTs that we could do it, and that was safe, that we knew the transition to second line onto a protease inhibitor was very effective. And then in 2012, um, I remember being coffee co um, shop conversations when the, for the first time dolutegravir was dangled in front of us. Now I was quite irritated at the time. I was thinking, I spent all this time getting everyone onto TL, on TLE, onto efavirenz based regimens. Yeah, these people come with this new, shiny new drug, dolutegravir. What does it actually provide? Efavirenz really works well. It's really well tolerated. Um, why do we need a new drug? And then we started to see the problems with efavirenz. And we started to see that the transition to second line was happening more and more often, and we started seeing the warts with efavirenz. I think the lesson here is that we must be careful. We are so dependent on the second generation integrase inhibitors. If something goes wrong, we have nothing to replace them with. We can't go back to efavirenz. We are going to need to just be thinking in the back of our, our, our minds, what if something goes wrong? And we can't throw everything out and say no new drug discovery is required. And I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. And we need to remember that the, we, the registration, the early studies often do not pick up the real side effects. They often exaggerate others. We get all excited about stuff. And we've, I've been here at this conference. Everyone keeps telling me, be careful. We're seeing lots of this explosive diabetes. We don't see that in anywhere else in the globe. But if it's true, if we're seeing lots and lots of diabetes, that might be the side effect that no one else is able to describe. And I'm pleading with you, please describe those, those side effects. Remember D4T, the registration studies did not pick up lipoatrophy. Um, it barely picked up peripheral neuropathy. Um, if you go and look at the original D4T registration, even the tenofovir registration studies did not pick up the D4T side effects. It was only when they started get, got used at scale that we started to see those, um, those studies. So please, when you start seeing any of the side effects associated with the combination of TLD, start describing that stuff. Put it out there in the literature. AZT, it took ages for us to see the lipoatrophy that, that was associated. Now we all know it. We all, you know, it's a really toxic drug. And in fact, I think most of us are more worried about AZT lipoatrophy than we were worried about the gastrointestinal 
and the anemia side effects, which are actually really predictable and easy to, to manage relative to the lipo atrophy. Um, so now for you, everyone's worried about the renal failure, but actually it's really unusual, particularly in young people. And we have the PrEP studies and everything, so we're all very, very worried about it, but actually it didn't transpire as much as we were worried about. Dolly Tech, you remember all those side effects they were worried about. Hepatitis, insomnia, iris, they all turned out to be really be non-issues. Now we need to see, is this diabetes stuff actually something we need to worry about? Lesson 3.1 is do this, well lesson 3 is do the studies in the population are going to get the drugs. And that means in Africans, and it means in African women in particular. Firstly, do it in women. Find out about pregnancy. Find out about PMTCT. You know, the problem with many of these studies is they get done in gay white men in Northern America, still to this day. And you don't see the toxicities that we need to see. And I'm going to come back to the one that we all worry about now. Um, Andrew Hill did the study which looked at, even within North America, the studies aren't representative of North American European populations for the new drugs that came out. Dolitegvir, Duravarine, um, all these studies are not representative of the patients that are going to get it. We need to push hard for independent studies, but also that the drug companies keep enrolling black people, that they enrolled women into their studies as much as possible. We need the pressure to be on them. I'm happy to see that there is this shift, and I think within the companies themselves there is this shift, but we need to keep the pressure on that they keep to do this. Um, and registration studies need to do better, but our own, like our own people internally need to keep pushing for us to do these independent studies. We need to, st uh, we've talked about this um, in the, the Monday session, some of you weren't there, but we need to anticipate that the long-acting injectables are on their way. And some of these long actings may be oral. The big drug that we were hoping is Latrivia, unfortunately, has been, has been paused. Um, the long acting oral drug. But these injectables are on their way. I don't, it's hard to understand how oral TLD is going to be improved upon. It's just the resistance barrier and it's so well tolerated. I don't understand how we're going to do so much better with it. But it's possible. Maybe something, as I said, we don't want to throw out any new drug development. But we need to think as Africans, how are we going to get our systems to deliver these injectables? Operationally, it's really hard. It's difficult to start you know, dealing with needles, dealing with uh, aliquoting stuff up. How, how do we set this stuff up? Um, and there's all sorts of issues around drugs like cabotegravir, which has got these phenomenally long tails, and resistance, bringing patients back, making sure that resistance doesn't develop. We need to start thinking about this stuff as we go along. Um, and these, the roots of administration might be the stuff that's really challenging, rather than worrying about side effects and resistance and all the rest of it. So these things are really interesting, but they are very, very challenging at the same time. And these operational challenges are things which we really need to start applying ahead. We need to start asking the, the psychiatrists, because they've been thinking about people involved in contraception um, in, at scale. Um, we need to really be stepping outside of our comfort zones um, once again. You're all aware of weight gain, and talking to many of the clinicians here, certainly in our clinics in Johannesburg, this is all that we're dealing with. It's the only side effect that matters with TLD. I know that many of you are also worried about diabetes and this kind of explosive hyperglycemia that seems to be a very much a feature here in Central Africa. I can say we haven't been seeing it, um, certainly in the clinics since, um, around us. And as I say, please describe the hyperglycemia. But obesity, new onset obesity is explosive. We, you honestly would think we're running a type two diabetes clinic um, where I'm from. But it's a straight line trajectory and we have nothing to offer these patients at the moment. And we're, not certain, we're, almost, we're almost certain it's not related to dolotegravir and bictegravir. Um, it certainly is related to being a, a woman, to being black, to being having a low CD4 count or a high viral load when you're starting it. Um, most of us, I think, now don't even think it's related to being on TAF. Um, but the trajectory is a straight line, and it has huge implications for drug um, development if it's not TAF and if it's not related to dolotegravir, because it means it doesn't matter what new drugs we come up with. Everyone is going to gain weight who's HIV positive. We've, and it's not just women. We're seeing it even in the men that the majority of them are ending up obese eventually, which means your HIV patients are all going to get are going to get fat, and we have n nothing to offer them other than to tell them to exercise and, get, and, and to, to diet, which we know from the literature um, is actually f a failure in the vast majority of patients. So what are the last lessons I would say? The, ne the next breakthroughs may not be ARVs. You know, it may be that this is as good as it gets, that TLD, the benefits are incremental after this. There might be benefits, but they're very, very small. 
And what do my patients need? They, well, we still need the early diagnosis. We must recognize that still about 20% of our patients are coming in late. So that means early HIV diagnosis is still a big deal. Um, and we need to find out who that 20% is, because it doesn't matter whether you're in Washington, whether you're in Delhi, whether you're in Johannesburg or in Kampala, a significant number of patients are still coming with TB, they're coming with crypto, and those patients we need to find out, we need to diagnose them earlier. Um, we're still finding retention in care is an issue, that some patients just fall out of care and we need to find out what's happening there. And that stuff's boring. It's much more exciting to go and find out the new drugs and you know, run around and like, advocate for that. But the kind of stuff that the support systems around our patients, we don't pay enough attention to. I really think we need to be starting to think about the obesity drugs. Um, the, the lifestyle stuff, there is tons of evidence to suggest that a healthy diet and exercise is really, really important for your health. It doesn't allow you to lose weight. And once you've made your peace with that, um, what we're offering our patients is a false hope in the clinics. When you sit there and say you must exercise and you must, you know, you must, uh, you must diet because that will help you to lose, it's actually a bit of a lie. When you look at the data, that does not allow people to lose weight. And if that's the case, we have nothing to offer our patients. We need to have interventions that work. And from what I can see from the literature, the things that do work are obesity, drugs, and surgery. And we know that in our environment, the surgery is hugely expensive. It's, um, it's risky. It's not something that's going to be something we've got to uh, make available. These new classes of drugs are coming at the moment. We may need to have them available very, very quickly to our patients alongside the AOVs if this is something we're going to need to have uh, um, in front of us. And, and we also need appropriate lifestyle advice, you know, like telling people to go and get their gym membership up to date in our environment is just ridiculous in a country that, uh, in countries where, where people are, are, are poor. Um, and then I think the other thing is look at diabetes care and non-communicable diseases. I think in our environment, we all, if everyone's gonna get this large, we've, we've got a wave of hypertension, diabetes, lipid problems and issues. How are we going to screen for that effectively and provide um, interventions that are appropriate? And finally, keep an eye on the cure. Um, whatever comes along, I, there's a huge amount of money still being pure, uh, poured into cure research. I don't know how the public health approach is going to deal with this. Um, it's very good at providing ARVs. The public health approach has not been very good at providing anything else. Um, it's not been very good at screening for non-communicable diseases. It's not been very good at providing contraception. It's not been very good at providing nutrition support. It's not been very good at providing anything other than diagnosis and provision. Of, of HIV. So just keep that in the back of your mind. All those other things that are on there are, I have actually not done very well. So this is where the public health really approach really needs to be challenged a little bit, is I would ask is that the context of care, health delivery, um, is actually going to need to maybe be upgraded. It's not simply about getting a diagnosis and handing out the tablets to people. Um, and if we're going to take it to the next step, we really are going to have to step up a little bit. And it's the context of care. We're going to need to make it more friendly. We're going to make it more useful to our patients. And I hate the word, but more holistic um, in terms of what it's going to need to do for people. And we, at the moment, the health system as a whole, and you guys will get this, we provide tablets. We don't provide health. You know, we provide injections. We don't provide health. If food is so important to health, why do, does the health system not provide food? You know, that we need to understand is that if we are healthcare workers, why are we not experts on providing food? Why are we not experts on providing safe water? And Afri it's all blows my mind still in Africa that we have most of Africa still does not have access to safe water. I and mean, South Africa is making huge gains in terms of making its water supply less safe with every passing year. You know, and it's, it really is horrifying to me is that we're fighting for Dolotegra at the same time as our water supply is getting less and less safe. And we, as healthcare workers, we need to be making more of a noise about the basics again. And for our HIV patients, it's probably much more important for us to, to get access to water than it is to safe water than it is to get access to long-acting injectables. And we need to be starting to advocate for these things for us. And these structural determinants are really, really important. All the stuff that actually we're not that good at dealing with, substance use, mental health issues, starting to think more creatively around those things, I think is going to be um, is going to be, and just to close off, at the very least, um, our systems of care provision, can we make them at least not make patients' lives worse? Not have stock outs in our clinics, not make patients come back again and again, not make them miserable, I think is going to be very important as we go forward. But can we maybe add a, a value add to our patients that would allow them to um, 
to, to find the systems of care that we're actually giving to them that much better. And start stopping the distraction of new drugs and new, the shiny new things that come along and start paying more attention, I think, to the fundamentals of HIV care that is far beyond just the drugs that we, we, we hand to them. Thanks very much.